So our demonstrator tonight is all the way from Minneapolis, St. Paul area. Um, Linda has been, Linda Ferber has been turning for how many years, Linda? 24 years. 24 years. Wow, good for you. She has done a lot with the AAW. Um, I first met Linda through the Women in, in Exchange, we, Women Interning Exchange last year. She and Marie Anderson head that up, so that's a major project every year in itself. Um, it, just very creative in everything she does and very artistic, so I think you'll all enjoy her demonstration tonight. Oh, thank you, everyone. I wanted to um, thank you for inviting me. It's really good to see all of you. And I wanted to show off my apron, um, advertise the AAW Women Interning Virtual Exchange. We will be holding that in August this year, and this will be our fifth virtual, and um, we have two in person. So it is um, a really good opportunity for women to um, network, to meet other women, and it is awesome to see that your officers that women are getting involved and active. And um, a big thank you to all the people that volunteer. But um, there is a lot in common. In my chapter in Minnesota, Minnesota Wood Turners, I'm also the vice president and program director. Say, woo. <laughs> you don't have to call us Madam Vice President, though. But I wanted to show off this. Um, apron because I'm very proud of it. And all of the um, virtual exchanges, the women have to be accountable and do a five minute video at the end documenting their experience in the process. And all of those are archived on the AAW website. And I know from a personal experience that these collaborations do spur creativity and bonding. And today, you probably notice I'm not going to turn. So um, a lot of what I want to talk about involves tops, but also will center around the process. So whether you paint, carve, um, do any of those things. It is a process and developing something that interests you, following that um, through is really something I encourage. So I want to first talk about a little bit about safety. And safety and carving is very similar, but a little different than turning. First off, w I do wear um, a power cap while I'm turning and carving, and that gives, uh, um, I shouldn't have looked there, oh my goodness. Um, it gives you fresh air, so you're protecting your lungs. I have in my shop an overhead exhaust, I have a dust collector, and then I have a Powermatic big fan that um, sucks the air and clears the air. And part of this is for myself because I end up spending three, four hours a day in all of that dust. And it is good to think and do as much as you can to protect yourself, just like when turning. So for tonight when I'm carving, I'm going to use this. And this is an RZ mask. It has filter here as well as inside. So it is a little more protection than an N95, but it's something to just be aware of. And I know it's hard to hear and all of that if I have a mask on, but we'll it's important to talk about. And I mentioned that um, I really like the process, and I would like and encourage you to ask questions. So some of you know if you ask a question, you get a piece of candy today. 
So encouragement and reward is all what it's about. So what kind of candy? Oh, it, you, I, <laughs> I'm glad you broke the, the ice there, Tom. Oh, here. Oh, good, good catch, good, good catch. Yes. So um, when I retired, many people generously sent me tops. I had a top collection, and I got over 200 tops from just everyone in the world. And there's some um, outstanding pieces, and I could show you pictures and talk about that for two hours, but we will have to skip that. So I have always been interested and fascinated with tops. So the, which one just, wants? Just lay, it down. just lay it down. Okay. So in a top, there are four main parts. The crown, the handle, shoulder, body, point, and tip. And all of those together make it spin. Well, mine I started calling wobblers because they don't always spin. They're there for your looks. I wrote an article for Wood Turning Fundamentals, and those will all look familiar what's on the table today. So if you're an AAW member, I did send it to Margo so, or Margaret, so I don't know if... Okay, you did. All right, so that is um, available and has um, documented some of the items. So what I like to do, and here is the, the process, um, in the evening or sometime when I'm too tired for turning, I will do drawing and sketching and dreaming, and what I try to do is... Um, be prepared when I'm determining that I am confident and sure what I'm doing is right because like we talked earlier, the wood never speaks to me. It never says, turn me into a snowman. So I do drawings and sketches and possibilities and I d not all of them are... Um, ones that turn out, but it just spurs the imagination and also is part of the process then f for that drawing out. I work on little storyboards and when I turn, I turn a lot of tops, I turn mushrooms, and when I get past 10, I'm done sketching but I have enough muscle memory and experience. And some of those, because of intuition or experience, things happen. So I try to embrace both the structure and organization and being precise to, OK, whatever happens. And, but that's still not the wood talking to me. So. I've done a lot of painting, a lot of carving, and with that process, I also do um, these um, sample boards. And I tried to write on the back what I did, and one of the um, examples, I bought three colors of leather dye and did sample boards to see what that looks like, and there were a few things I discovered before I did the turning that really helped me. And one of them was that when I sand for painting, I only go up to 220. But for leather dyes, that didn't work because it showed every little one of those scratches. So a lot of times, you will hear phrases and people talk about things in wood turning. And one thing that really has stuck with me is that I can do anything with three tools. How many people have heard that? You only need three tools and you can do everything. 
Yeah. So I took that same philosophy with carving. And I thought, if I buy or start off with three burrs, and I don't mean literally three burrs, but three styles or shapes that I can learn and Um, That doesn't mean I haven't taken or watched demos, and I certainly have, so I'm not by any means inventing anything. I'm absorbing things that I have seen and learned. So I'll have a sample board here of these three burrs. So I still, even after four years, I've expanded to four, but I still find most things that I do, I can accomplish with these shapes. And I'll put them out here. The first is a rotosa. Yep, they're a little further away. So the rotosa, and I'll go through and use each of them, is Fairly aggressive, moves wood quickly. A ball nose burr, and this one I chose because it will carve on the tip and the side both. And a ball, just because it makes a round shape, and it is fairly, um, it, it is very useful. And all three of these are saber tooth burrs. The the range comes in four grits. They have an aggressive, um, medium, and now um, a whisper. I guess that's three. But there's um, different grits, just like sandpaper. So the ball nose, or the ball burr, also comes in diamond tip, and I use that quite a bit for um, a finished process. The other burrs that I really like is the cup cutters. And you say, well, I can tell a lot, you know, I can tell people's work by looking at it. And part of that is, in my instance, because the shapes and the carving and the colors I prefer, that all goes through and shows up in many of the aspects of the work. So with the tops tonight, I wanted to show some carving, but also painting. And so I have five styles here of tops. Here's the ones that I have prepped for the talk tonight, and there's the same five that are finished. And what I really enjoy doing is experimenting and taking little bits of things I've learned and try it in new combinations. So a lot of things that I showing here are very easy and intuitive. But one thing I like to do is in this example is do the painting on the lathe. And I know you know that's possible. A lot of people put paint on the rims of platters and bowls on the lathe, but how many besides putting black on a finial, how many people are conscious of painting on the lathe? So my lathe, um, I don't want to get full of paint, so I buy these at the big box store. Is that, it's just a magnetic vent cover, and they will, you can go over your tool rest and on the bed of the lathe and catch some of the splatter. That doesn't protect the back wall, doesn't protect your front or any of those things. But the important thing, the lathe is protected. Um, The the wall in my shop is, yeah, a splatter zone. Um, Yes, yes, it is. 
modern art embellished. You can see my favorite colors. And the, um, the, if you're, the slower your lathe goes, the less splatters, okay? And if your lathe doesn't go slow enough, you can hand turn it, but still paint. And what you'll ask, and I'm sure someone will ask, what is the advantage? I'm sorry, I, I can throw away another. What is the advantage to painting it on the lathe? Well, speed. Yeah, ask that question. What's the advantage of painting on the lathe? Oh, I'm so happy you asked that question right now because it's right at the perfect opportunity. So this is a little wobbler that is a donut. And when I started first doing it, I turned him, took to my workbench and spent 10 minutes painting. And I slopped over the edges. So I painted on the lathe, slop on the wall, but I can clean up the edges with a skew or a piece of sandpaper. And it took me nowhere near as long and I get good coverage. The disadvantage is that you have to wait a little bit for paint to dry. Because if you don't, you get sawdust in wet paint. Just, you know. Oh, yes. Oh, maybe I'll get better. OK. Well, that in a hair dryer. <laughs> and, <laughs> well, you can buy them from $10 at the drugstore. <laughs> well, my hair dryer just looks like my wall full of paint. <laughs> Someone visited and said, can I borrow your hair dryer? And I was embarrassed to show it, but, but I lived through it. So it is good, and it is nice to have a clean, crisp edge. And so that's one point I'd like to bring out. And this is another, um, this is an inexpensive tool, but it's very nice tool. It is a color wheel. You, you can buy a more elaborate ones that spin and tell you so much. Um, I know you can search and Google colors, but looking on the screen isn't quite the same as looking on a printed copy. So um, listen to demos. And I know someone earlier said they had taken um, or watched the demo of Graham Priddle. And one I have as well, and the one thing that really stood out and I really resonated with me that he said, I like to create an item that brings people's attention. Then I like to put in detail so when they look closer, they're surprised and see more. So he wants to add that layer of detail. And you can only do that layer of detail and all that with um, intentional steps. And that comes with practice, and that comes with um, good eyesight and experience. The good eyesight, I'm, it, it's gone. That's not coming back. But, but those little tiny tops are not a gallery quality item. It's not something that's going to be f worth thousands of dollars. But do I pay uh, as much attention to them as I can? Because just like in turning them, I'm building my vocabulary, my skills. And so repeating and doing those actions over and over, and letting yourself experiment really are worth it. So, when you turn them, do you go from here to there or here to there? Okay, the question is when I turn a top, 
do I, when I turn the top, I have the um, handle at the headstock because I like to turn the, um, the, the tip last, or first, rather. So first thing I do is take the block and turn a tenon, and then put that in the chuck. I try to not to have too large of a block of wood that it is um, vibrating. Of course, my beautiful lathe would never bri vibrate, but if that did happen, I want the wood as close to the headstock as possible. I have um, made tops that are mushrooms that I want the handle to be a certain diameter in a fit in a holder. In those cases, I turned it out so I could measure that as I go along, but most times it's the other way. So that's a good question. Got me to use one of my props, too. All right. I did t talk about burrs, and so I'm going to turn this on and see if it works. Yep, it does. We're good. So one of the tops that I like to make is this spaceship. And the spaceship... I did not paint on the lathe because in this instance, I painted the whole thing black. <coughs> but I painted it after I did carving. So when I'm doing carving or wood burning, I don't like to do that on top of paint or varnish or sealer or any other chemical because here again, breathing that is not a healthy thing. So in this case, because I'm doing carving, um, I didn't, um, you know, paint it on the lathe. So the first, here is the sample, and you can see it's, it's not sanded too well, but it is sanded to about 220, and it's no finish, no varnish, no sanding sealer, no Dr. Kirk's, nothing. So I should stop a minute, and before I turn this on, topic about equipment. So um, I have four carving units at home. Um, two of them are Dremel. This Dremel, I have a hand piece and the, um, a stand, so it is um, a little easier to operate. The Dremel is an inexpensive starting point. If you're not sure how much carving you want to do or how much investment you want to do, the Dremel is inexpensive. This hand piece is only $30, so it's not for a hundred and so dollars you can get this whole setup. And it will do the job. It will give you taste of the thing. So it's always fun to go and buy a thousand dollar piece of equipment, but you can um, save yourself some money if you want um, the lower end. The disadvantage of the Dremel is that it is noisy. This is too big and vibrates too much for my hand. Um, I can't carve with this very long. So the hand piece does address some of those issues. The other downside of the Dremel, in order to change the burr, I have to use this little wrench, push a button, open up and remove and insert the burr. So it's not instantaneous. The next piece of equipment I have at home is a microcarver, and that will range you from 200 to $2,000, depending on the um, s 
the um, sturdiness, the quality, and all of that. The one I have is about four or five hundred dollars now, and that is extremely quiet, no vibration. It um, does have some downfalls. You can um, get too aggressive for something like this, and the handpiece gets warm, so it's an indicator you're overtaxing the machine or the brushes in the handpiece. So it is, I'm on th my third machine. The th first two were the $99 blue, which is now $200, but the, these, um, hand pieces wear out and the hand piece is as expensive as a new unit. So unfortunately it has a lot of advantages. Changing the burr is a simple twist on the hand piece, insert, twist to tighten, and it takes 10 seconds. So that is um, ideal. The next piece, I went and bought a Fordham. And the Fordham has the advantage of more power, like the Dremel. I'm not going to burn out that motor. It has, um, similar to this, you put it on a stand, have a cord, and you, in most cases, have the power on your foot pedal. So the speed is instantaneous. So if you need more power, you can go quickly. The other advantage is that it will go in reverse. So instead of carving towards you, you're carving away, which is good for two reasons. It takes a little bit of the sawdust away from your face. And um, sometimes if, you, something, if you're going too fast or careless, this will jump and carve whatever is in its path. So be that your clothes or your hands or your fingernails. So with the Fordham going in reverse, there is less chance of there. So each one of these options has um, advantages, Question. disadvantage. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, someone's trying to get your candy. <laughs> you can keep it. <laughs> so. What about the burrs? Do they all work in reverse or just some of yes. them? Yes. Oh, that's a good question. Since you had a microphone, I don't need to repeat that, right? Okay. So the, um, the burrs all will work in reverse. The ad other advantage, I didn't speak of the Fordham. All the burrs for the Dremel and the microcarver are 1-8 in three thirty seconds on the shaft. The Fordham goes up to one quarter inch. So more, lots more power. So you can take a big burr, this big, big aggressive teeth and really remove wood quickly with that Fordham. The unit I bought has two hand pieces, one for the one eight three thirty second and one for the one quarter. And changing the hand pieces takes a while. You know, it's just like Chuck. How many people own more than one Chuck? Okay, so why is that? Because we're too lazy to change the jaws. Okay, changing burrs is just like changing jaws. It's a little quicker, but, but there's, you know, there's things in common. Okay, I'm going to get diverted and not get done here. But yes, please ask questions because that's a good question. They're all good. Okay, I'm going to put this mask on for a couple minutes because this machine is a, creates a little dust. I should have, oh, wow. Oh, wake you all up. I'm going to push this down. I should give you all a mask and not just be selfish and wear my one myself. Okay, so with the carving I mentioned, the carver 
doesn't care if it's carving wood or if if it's carving it doesn't care what it is so you can see a, yeah some things happen the dremel does have variable speed i try to always be secure i never turn it on when i have it in my lap because it will spin your clothes and just like getting in the lathe that might be um, hazardous so this has very aggressive teeth i hold my hands firmly and support the work and make contact you can see the dust i can go through many layers to deepen the um, the cuts and this burr does leave a lot of um, marks and most times what i'm la after is textures and marks then on this safe spaceship i didn't want them so i take this same burr and used it going in the other direction to try to smooth them out and erase some. So there I have a fairly deep carving and what I'm doing on my spaceship is carving the little windows where the aliens are peeking out, watching where they're landing to check us out. So carving just like wood turning or any other craft takes some experimenting and takes some practice, understanding your tools, understanding and respecting your skills. So um, on the example with a little space, there is our aliens peeking out. So I take one of the cup cutters, one of my favorite pieces, and <coughs> oh yes, absolutely. I take the cup cutter to um, carve out the aliens. I'm still holding it securely. I'm protecting um, my hands. pushing this in to get little tiny alien eyes. And you can see these do create a lot of dust. And the other piece of equipment I have is a fume extractor. And I use that wood burning and things like this cup cutter. OK, so the. Um, like I mentioned from that experience on Graham Priddle, I like to have details. I like to have every area um, covered and show that I did do work on it. And so what I'm going to do is some scribbling to create the texture around the ship. And that's to show the uh, reflection of the silver metal on the spaceship. And what I need to do is take the whole thing apart and put in a different color size. And as you can see, you don't do this on an impulse. You have a couple Dremels and a microcarver around so you don't have to stop for five minutes to exchange. But you can do it. I'm just being funny. The cup cutter, the question is, where do I buy the cup cutters? <laughs> Pretty soon, I'm going to need this in, an assistant. So the cup cutters, 
the cup cutters I get from MDI wood carvers, and they're branded under Michael K's. So he, we looked them up on their website last night, and they were under cup cutters. Their website on uh, the phone is a little, yeah. yeah, it's a little. So I have a ball burr here, and this is a diamond burr, and I use this to do a scribbled pattern. And I use that a lot on my mushrooms as well, the blue one. So here's another example on the mushrooms, so that creates the texture on the stem. And here, same um, situation, I'm pulling the burr towards myself and scribbling. And that creates a little texture around the windows of the spaceship. I drew a circle to raise the edges of the window. If I didn't mention, some people say, well, I'll do, I'll do carving, I'll do painting, because I can cover up everything. And I'm here to tell you that's, that's not the case. That doesn't work. If you have a bad curve, if you have tool marks, if you have some amount of 80 degree sanding scratches, carving will not cover them up. Especially that bad curve. Bad curve is bad form no matter what. So in this instance of the spaceship, I've used the roto cutter, the um, cup cutters, and the diamond. And given um, texture when I'm done to everything. The last time I, or last thing I did on that example, um, I'll show on one of the others, and it is the puff paint. And I don't see it right now, but I'm sure it's here somewhere. So we'll cover that as soon as I find it. Any questions on the simple carving on the spaceship? <coughs> okay, you can see a lot of similarities because using the burrs on my, yeah. Yes, the other one as well. One of the mushrooms that is going around again has two small mushrooms on the side. And that is, um, oh, you got it. That is a tip I learned from watching a demo by Kristen LeVere. And she turns eggs in spoons and wraps leaves around it. And how she adheres it is that she takes and drills a very tiny hole, to, puts a toothpick in it that will go through the leaf, or in my case, a mushroom that I'm adhering, puts a glue down and then a toothpick through that hole. And so when you're done, you can, with the clippers, cut off that extra um, mushroom and very, very good to go. It's secure. This is another of the wobbler tops that um, requires some carving, and that is the stem. So the, um, I don't want to get you all full of dust, so I'll show you different stages. When the apple is turned, I have roughed up the area that is um, the bite out of the apple with a skew or any sharp tool will do, and then painted it on the lathe. So this is the shape 
This is the shape that it starts right off the lathe. Then I try to envision that little stem. Here's the finished one. I try to envision. Just turn them because they're, they're upside down on the camera. They're upside down. Now they're right side up. Maybe. Yeah. Well, I'll. I'll there you go. Okay. They're good now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. It went over my head, but you guys got it under control. All right. So this is the starting. I want a little bit of stem with a um, little curve in it. So I take the um, ball nose and just with a um, fairly aggressive cutting, pull it towards me to remove that wood. Then it does eventually get thin enough and start to look in proportion and finally comes out to be a little stem on the top. So I will pass these around and I'll take out, oh, maybe I should, uh, I've got another one here. So I'll take out another top that I have ready and start that carving for you. I won't do a lot of it. I'll just give you an indication of the steps. And like I said, here mostly I'm here to encourage you to explore and try new things and maybe be inspired by something to that might fit in with your work, something that will fit in or um, enhance what you are doing. I've got four collets in there, so I wanna make sure I've got the right size before I put it on. So I think this is good. This is the ball nose carver, and it is one of the saber tooth from MDI wood carvers, and it is fairly aggressive. And you'll notice in a lot of the things, um, in particular those mushrooms that are going around, that I do like the textures that these aggressive burrs leave, but at times I don't. So I will go through the process, um, and I'll do that on this stem, is walk through the process of the sanding in so here we go again. Okay, I think, did I get it? Okay, all right. All right, here is the trouble. Just like turning, a lot of these burrs are fairly aggressive make quick work it helps to put your finger out just like drinking tea What I'm doing now is shaping the top of the stem, having it follow through with the curve. Okay. Just like the samples I passed around, this one isn't complete, but you can see fairly quickly by envisioning what the item looks like and taking several points of the item you're working on and trying to transfer that to the work. So 
for uh, apple with a bite out of it, there's the color of the apple, there's the white inside of the apple, and the curve of the stem. So it is enough for a person to say, that's an apple. And you may ask, someone may ask, why do I call them wobblers? And maybe I said this already. It's because I call them wobblers because they don't always spin. So there we go. I don't have to head, hang my head in shame because they don't spin. OK, so you can see on this apple with that aggressive burr that I have little torn grain and fuzzies. See, that's not good. And if you paint, it's still not going to be good. And taking the piece of sandpaper is going to be too slow to much work. So what I do is then take the diamond burr and go through and smooth those out. And so what I'm going to do is take the um, whisper burr, and I'm searching. I had it in front of me two minutes ago. There it is. And this is one of the finer cores or grits on the saber tooth burrs. And I'm going to use this as my first line of cleaning up and inserting detail. So I gently go over the area that has the little torn grain. I can go through and remove these big coarse lines and start the process for smoothing it out. So just thinking about it is um, um, the finishing process, whether you call it sanding or inserting detail. The last bit of process that I do go through is these little burrs that are like scotch bright. You know, we've all heard of Minnesota mining. So they have, I, my little cheat sheet, the brown is 120 grit, the green is 180, the red, hmm, the red disappeared. The red is 320 and the black is 400. So you can go through the progression just like the sandpaper. And those use the same collet. So I'm going to put in the um, brown. And just like sandpaper, you can see they do wear out. This is a green one that as you're using it, the Scotch-Brite type material does, well, it just disappears. I don't know um, if it ends up in sawdust or what it has, but this then is a good method for um, doing the final finishing and sanding and um, making sure everything is up to good details. So that gives you just an idea of the process. I didn't go through to finish um, but just like paint drying, watching, you know, one stem for 45 minutes might not be the best entertainment for the evening. So I'm going to put these aside for the moment, and that will be putting aside all the dust and all of that and go to painting. And 
So with the painting, I do start in a lot of the cases is, is painting like on the lathe, like I said. So the three examples we have left are a, a donut, a snow person, and a top hat. So I'm going to do the donut first. So let me take a second and drag out my paints, the beads, the brushes, and get all set up for that. So the donut I think of just like if I was making a donut, I wanted to do frosting. And through extensive research, I have found that eating donuts, yes, and com taking my color chart to the donut store and, yeah. You know, it's tough work. It really is tough work. <laughs> but, yeah, someone's got to pave the way. And I have found that... Boy, that color doesn't look right. Oh, there it is. I have found that raw sienna matches donuts. So take my word, raw sienna. So that's the color that it is painted. And, huh? Yes, yes, I'm sorry. The, the question is, is this acrylic? And that is an excellent question, and pardon me for not including that. I like acrylics. Do you always use the golden brown paint? <laughs> or do you try other acrylic brown paint? Okay. The question is, what brand, what quality, what type of acrylics do I prefer? I prefer the golden brand acrylics. I use those um, in things I make I have inexpensive medium inexpensive and these are you know inexpensive so I still like to use artist quality paints but maybe not golden so these are black I, I buy them online and they classify them as artist quality acrylics. They are seven or eight dollars a tube. The golden is fifteen dollars a tube. So um, there are advantages, very good advantages to golden, but this works well. I it first started painting with the $1.29 tubes from Michaels or Joanne Fabrics and someone just said, you know, those are too shiny. They look like cheap paint and they're not going to last. So the, the um, goal is not to have this look like plastic. Acrylic is plastic, so you want a higher quality so that it doesn't have that shiny uh, um, plastic look. And the golden has very intense, beautiful um, colors, uh, color palettes. And yes. Whoops. Ah. That's all I wanted. Um, <laughs> do, you always, do you always use matte acrylics? The quest, well, he had a microphone, so I don't have to repeat it. But yes, I prefer the matte acrylics. Except, like on those mushrooms I paint, oh, I can't ever resist a little bit of glitter and shine on the top. You know, and then I do go to Joanne Fabric and buy these color shift. Golden just also has iridescent paints. And when I get to painting at the end, I'll put some of that on. That 
bottle here is um, a black flash and it goes well on a darkly painted item, gives a little hint of bronze or gold in the background. And I think of it as just another little detail. This blue goes from blue to silver. So um, yeah, I dip into the glitters and the color shift. They are lots of fun. Um, and you can tell on the donuts, I add sprinkles too. So the donut needs to have a frosting. And for the frosting, I use this, um, which direction? The golden regular gel gloss. And what that looks like is paint itself. It, it really looks like paint. But if I don't add a pigment to it, when it dries, it's going to be like clear. So um, it is not an adhesive, but it's enough to stick the sprinkles on the donut. So I have strawberry, chocolate, or vanilla. What kind of donuts? Chocolate. Chocolate. Okay. Since this is the color <laughs> of the cone donut, I'm going to um, use burnt umber. And I'm going to use raw sienna. And I should have a third brown. And this is burnt sienna. So I am going to use all three of those browns that I have with me to um, mix up the frosting. And one thing with um, painting, a paintbrush is a tool. It's not an expen as expensive you can pass those along if, if you want. It's not as expensive as your bow gouge, but nonetheless, if you're spending $15, $20 on a paintbrush, you want to take care of it. One of the things is um, not um, leaving them unwashed, not leaving them soaking in water, and The question is, what kind of brush do you use? Um, natural, natural, synthetic, or blended? And I think I'm not at the point of buying $25 excellent brushes. I try to keep them in $9, $10. So I, I really like to go when Dick Blick has clearance sales and get the brushes then. Yeah. A blend in. So it does, um, it still does have a life cycle and it, they still will wear out, but if you care for them, they'll last a little longer. And I'm not sure that I made enough frosting, but um, another expensive tool, a uh, fork from our cutlery. I pick up some frosting and just put it on the donut. I found that when I was making the donuts, the first couple, I um, didn't paint all the way to the edge, and I found it didn't look as donut-like. So I tried to um, get it to represent and be as close to the object so a person immediately can see that it is a donut. And when I did mix that, I tried not to mix it too good so there is some variance of the color. And here, even it, oh, it's just a little wobbler paint, 
um, a top and paint, I wanted to have a little bit of surprise. So I didn't make enough frosting, so I only got part way through. This board is also serves as the drying board, and I have a little um, container of beads that I am going to use for the sprinkles. So pretty much just drop them on. And I've got a lot on there, but some of them will fall off. And I do a little bit of pushing them down so they get glued in a little better. I think I put in too many sprinkles. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so what I'm going I'm doing is going back and putting some of the swirls back in because frosting is never smooth. Well, maybe it is on TV, but in real life frosting is not um smooth. It has some dimension. So that's what I was trying to create. Something that was whimsical and that um, people can identify and recognize right away. So who wouldn't want to spin a top that looks like a donut? So I'm going to do the snow person next. So that is a different color and I'm gonna try to clean off part, I didn't bring paper towels with me today. So um, this, oh good, thank you. This um, gel acrylic is very, um, very nice and easy to use and gives a lot of character and detail to your turning. But what, um, what it does do is, thank you, is take some time to dry. So that little donut might take an hour to dry, which, well, we will move on so we don't have to watch it. And I'm going to move to the snowman. And this, this is the finished one. It has a little toothpick nose. It was painted on the lathe black and white. So we can pass that one around if you'd like. And I don't see my puff paint, so I'm gonna have to turn my back on you and look in my suitcase. And here it is. When I travel with paint, I always put them in bags so that, well, double bags so that if it explodes, it can be contained. Okay, so first off with the snow person, I need to um, stop painting your table. I need to clear my palette a little bit and switch colors. With the snowman, a lot of the snow is white and sometimes it's um, a little yellow. I tried on one of them to, <laughs> to um, yeah, don't eat the, no make a snow person out of yellow snow. Um, I'm using white tonight, but I have tried a little blue also to indicate that it was cold, but I haven't found one that I like quite as much as the white, so, oh, it is. So it didn't quite give the effect of coldness that I wanted, but it's okay. You know, I experimented and tried to um, achieve an effect, and I, th I haven't given up. I'm going to try that again. Um, what I'm going to do today is be really wild and put a little bit of yellow in my snow since we agreed. 
well, where did that yellow, there it is. And I say yellow, it's a yellow oxide. I think the, the other yellow I have is a little bit too bright. And I'm just putting a little tiny, tiny drop. And sometimes when you experiment, it can be wild and crazy, and you say, whoa, that was a terrible idea. And sometimes it might be a bad idea, but it spurs you into a new direction. So I, I really like to use intuition and experiment. Um, when I started turning, I had gone to every demo that my chapter had, and the demonstrator could say, oh, that tool is sharpened wrong. Can I sharpen it for you? And I said, yes, yes, of course. And then I'd go home and I can't turn. So, so what I did, no one's ever said that before. What I did and decided is that I'm working, I have four hours a week to turn. I'm going to try to concentrate to direct my learning. I still went to every demo, took every class, but what I made in my time, I concentrated. So I would do a year of platters, and don't judge me, Tom, on my platters. So I, I took a year for um, another item, a uh, little box, uh, a bowl, although I didn't last a whole year with the bowls. Um, <laughs> but it, what it did is in the time I had, I could focus on what that one eighth of an inch did to my turning. So when I got to the year of the mushroom, I sort of have stagnated and continued mushrooms and tops because I'm just really interested in what the possibilities are, the broadness of what I can do. And so it, I encourage you to look at what interests you. Look at how you're learning. Go to every demo you can. Listen to everyone, even though, though that you'll never do painting or carving, but there may be something about the process, something about their procedure, something about the joy that it gives you following this process that you can be inspired for your own work. So I have mixed up that yellow, and I don't mind that. It, it, it's not yellow, yellow, but it has toned down that stark white. And you say, okay, that's a good one. So even though I paid a lot of attention not to paint outside the lay lines on the lathe, with the snow, you can go for it. You can go down the edge and paint all over. What I will do, though, is take my knife, and you'll notice I'm not using a paintbrush. For this, I want to take advantage of this gel and get as much texture as possible. That's why I'm using this gel medium, is to add texture to the paint and dimensions. So I'm trying to take advantage of that. And I've scraped out most of it, got painting around. I need to do a little dab on his hat because, of course, the snow falls all over. And then I take one of my more expensive tools, my finger, and put my fingerprint all over. And what that does is gently, well, I don't know if it's gentle, but um, easily, um, creates peaks and valleys. And sometimes if there's little, it does, in fact, put my fingerprint. 
and I have found so far my hands are wa wash and wear. So one thing I do try to do then is take my knife and just go around the neck because I did try to distinguish the first and t second um, layers of knife snow person. And you say, well, every snow person I've ever made has been three snowballs. How come yours is two? Well, I wanted a hat, and I thought, you still recognize, with two, you still recognize it. I'm not making it so darn tall. With three, I had a little more problems with proportions. And I wanted that hat, so I stuck with two. All right, so then to further enhance the snow person, I have used this puff paint. And that's not its official name, but it is a very expen inexpensive, yeah, not expensive, only a couple dollars uh, uh, thing. And it is really three, just called 3D paint. But puff paint sounds so much nicer. And what it is is for painting on T-shirts or sneakers to get 3D effects. And on this snow person that you have passed around, you can see the um, buttons and the holly are with this puff paint. So I have squirted out a little bit of paint and I did that so I know the nozzle is loaded and ready to go. I'll put um, three dots of green. They all blob together, but that's okay. You'll get the idea of a leaf, and then with the red, just put a little bit of holly. Ooh, that's what happens when paints fly. Okay. I should have put a piece of paper underneath me to protect your table. So I put a little berries next to the leaf. And the other thing I do with the pump paint is to um, use black and put on the buttons in the eyes. And we'll see if the black. How we doing on time? You were good. Well, the gel medium that you use is that pretty. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Is it pretty hard where you don't have to worry about it chipping off? Or that that is a good question. The question is the. 40 minutes is the durability and lasting of the gel medium. And it is a golden product, so we know it's good quality. I've done a lot of the snow people. If you s take the one that's passed around and squeeze the edges, it will stay in place. So some of these peaks might droop a little bit in the um, drying process, but they will stay there. So I'm going to apply a couple eyes and the three buttons. OK, so. The last thing that the snow person needs is a nose. And I know I could go turn a nose, but OK. They make toothpicks. And <laughs> someone else turned them. 
Yes. Do you know the difference between snowman and snowman? I do not know the difference. Snowball. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I won't repeat for that for the Zoom people. They'll have to just wonder what your joke was. All right. Well, I, I'm glad to be informed and educated. <laughs> so these are orange toothpicks. I don't even have to paint them. And it's a simple matter of you know, drilling a hole, gluing them in, and, cl you know, clipping it down to size. I could claim. Yeah, I could claim. I spend hours turning these toothpicks for you people, so I'm glad none of them. <laughs> yeah, the tree in the backyard is now this toothpick. But, um, I don't know if you've seen this glue. It is something I've um, discovered recently. I didn't discover it. I learned about it recently. It's tight bond, quick and thick. And I really like it. And it's just what the words say. It's a little thicker, like those mushrooms I glued on to the side of the mushroom. I didn't have a lot of cleanup. I... <clears throat> <coughs> I'm probably a little heavy on the glue because I'm concerned about the adhesion. So I probably put too much. This doesn't run. So um, what I do is take my turned nose and put it in the drill bit gauge so I get the right size, drill a hole in the proper place for the nose and insert it with this kind of glue. Um, that will have to be done after the painting is dry. I've tried it, doing it before, and I ended up with a nose that had snow all over it. And so, um, yeah, it was no, the <laughs> snowman's nose was, oh, that's a good one. <laughs> oh, oh, that's good. I should have written all those down. Oh, my. Okay. All right. So I um, enjoy the process of imagining, and a lot of times when I see something that I want to make, I see it complete at the end, and then have to figure out the steps to make that happen, or um, close to that as possible. So um, I could dig out some of my mushrooms. Someone said we have about 30 minutes or so to go, and I have no. gone... Oh, the hat. Oh, where did that go? Yeah. Well, there, oh, here it is. Okay. The other shape I have, and um, that is a top hat. And I tried to um, work with several different colors and, or uh, colors and shapes and they, I have made a m lot more of them that ended up in the garbage because they just didn't, um, they didn't resemble a hat, so, you know. Um, I had this vision of a, um, at 4th of July, uh, Uncle Sam's hat, and this is what I made, and it didn't quite look like his hat, but with the hats, I've tried the cup cutters. Oh, I went to the Barbie movie and made a pink hat and um, dipped in the glue for New Year's Eve, or the glitter for New Year's Eve. So, you know, you just have an idea and um, try to envision it and interpret it. This one looks... I don't know what I was trying to envision or what my goal was with that hat, but 
there in this one it is just uh, um, like um, Willy Wonka oh yes Alice in Wonderland that's what this one is Alice in Wonderland and so I saw online um, on Instagram, and I just love looking at other people's work, whether they're wood turners, ceramic painters, or whatnot, looking at their work. And um, Pat and Karen Miller have been doing a series of mice. And on that series of mice, there are very tiny dots. And I saw um, egg at your house from Graham Piddle that had those as well. And so I took out my sample board and the puff paint and did a bunch of rows of the little dots and then painted over them to give them um, on the piece texture, but not the variance in color. So that was an aha, oh, that I can use that. So that sample board, and I didn't even get a new one, just an old one, really was helpful because I could try out some new examples. And these little tiny dots really thrilled me. Um, I make a lot of mushrooms, and some of them are puff, painted red and then puff paint on the white on the top, big and fluffy dots. So I was used to using the material, but seeing it in the small controlled lines was really something that interested me. So I tried that on the hat, and I did like the idea I particularly like just putting those down and then painting over them so you don't. Oh, Tom's got a question. Don't forgive me again. Okay, okay. Remind us, should you ever use this piece? Yes. 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 There, Tom had reminded me that Louise Hibbert has done dots. I have seen my. Michael Hoselick and um, remind me what his, the man that mentored him. Um, yes, he was a very good friend. He did the ribbon series with the dots on it. Well, okay, it's been done before. We'll just admit that. And um, he, he was, a Canadian, Saint Frank Sudal, yes, and he did. Oh, here I'm going to have to relay this because that's too far. <laughs> oh, I owe him another because of the snowman. <laughs> yeah, he get he gets two, yes. <laughs> but Frank Sudal was the first person that I saw do that. And at the gallery at AEW, Wood Art, there is an exhibit Tib Shaw has of his work. And it shows a platter that has some holes drilled in leather strewn through. Very rudimentary. But it was his first step, his experimenting. And I have seen on video that um, Michael Hasselick asked him to, have you ever made anything for yourself? And he said, no. So he did that. He did what pleased him. And that made a difference. And it showed up in his work. And so getting back to that display, then there is a goblet that has carving and his ribbon type things, but still very rudimentary, you know, not polished like his later work. So we, we all learn, we all learn from everyone that we talk to, watch, or listen to, and we also learn 
from looking at museums and galleries. So from the chapter I'm in, we have over 300 members. And so there's a lot of people that are um, members and you don't know everyone. And in the time you have a meeting, you don't have time to talk to everyone. So our chapter has a lot of what we call splinter groups. And there might be a group of 10, 20 people that get together between chapter meetings that focus on something, whether it be when it's called a hamburger club and they focus on eating hamburgers. So one is segmenters and there, there's about six of them. So I, I was um, the interesting in the experience I've had the last few years in collaboration of working and collaborating with a group. We teach each other. So we visited Minneapolis Institute of Art and we picked out a piece that the group consensus we would use as inspiration. So we went to the Asian exhibit and there were little snuff box or jars. And so we said, that's what we'll do. We, we specified diameters. So it could be no taller than five inches. And it didn't have to be Asian, but it would be inspired on being a container of that size. And so then we... Um, have discussed in person and via email our um, our adventures, and I will show share one with you. One of the men is, you know, my age, and he went to a tobacco store, thing or vape store, and he wanted to learn more about snuff. And the clerk first ignored him. You know, some old man, he's not going to be buying anything. So he finally got his attention, asked him the question, and told him what his goal was. He wanted to buy some snuff. Well, they don't sell it. So he went online and looked at their distributors. No one sells it. So it was in China, the emperor outlawed smoking, so they put this snuff in little bottles, and it's not the same as chewing, I guess. So he learned a lot about snuff, and so then he learned about other things you might put in a little container like that, and there was a little glass one, and the, he showed it to Dwayne, and Dwayne says, how much is that? And he said, six dollars, and he says, oh, I'm not going to buy that, and he gave it to him. So he was just thrilled with his adventure to the tobacco store. So would, would my point is that find something that excites you, something that interests you, something that motivates you to keep being creative and to take your work or your attitude in a new direction or um, follow a, an avenue that um, you haven't explored today or before. Before I was a wood turner, I was a serial crafter. I did needlework, embroidery, stained glass, ceramics, and nothing really kept my interest for more than a year or two. With the stained glass, unless I went into designing the windows, um, there's only so many times I could look at a pattern, cut it out, put it together, and yay, look at that. Um, so, it, and that's just my fault, but wood turning, I have not found that end wall. I have always found something of interest, and I found a lot of things I know I will never do, uh, and Doug, Basque Illusion is one of them. <laughs> My brain just, hmm. 
So in segmenting is another. Each of us is different. Each of us makes different things. Each of us are inspired by different things. And wood turning offers that. So take advantage of that. Explore and learn as much and you know as widely as you can. And you know making a simple little top. It, you know, it may not be a challenge, but I look on it as a canvas that things I learn in experimenting on the tops will show up on my mushrooms or other work I do. So I think I fell a little short on or of using up all the time, but unless you have more questions, I still have some candies left. How far short did we come on time? We don't have a. Oh, we, we don't, don't have a. Oh, okay. Tough we have a, a. You can't go further then because the store closes. Oh, okay. <laughs> One thing I talked about but didn't show you is these paints, but um, you're welcome to come and look at those. So, question on those: Is that a highlight, or do you put it on the whole piece, or? Yeah, th that is very good question. I just use it sparingly and highlight. You can see what happens when you put too much glitter. It it looks like you're a ten year old with <laughs> the glue and glitter. You so, spilled it, in other words. Yeah, <laughs> yes, you want to use restraint. <laughs> Any more questions? Thank you very much. Okay.